Yeah. Um, hi, everyone. So I would like to first start with a land acknowledgement. Um, the University of Washington acknowledges the Coast Salish peoples of this land, the land which touches the shared waters of all tribes and bands within the Suquamish, Tuala, Puyallup, and Muckleshoot nations. The School of Aquatic and Fishery Sciences acknowledges that we are uninvited visitors to their homeland, as well as the homeland of the Duwamish people who continue to pursue federal recognition. Our school recognizes the key role that Coast Salish people have in managing salmon and other fisheries as sovereign nations and the coordinated government to government relationships that they have with US governing bodies. As uh, gathered from the Tuolup Tribes website, land acknowledgements may be a recently formed term, yet the practice of acknowledging the land and the people who have stewarded it since time immemorial is an indigenous practice. This acknowledgement is a commitment to the ongoing work of uplifting Native communities and protecting the land and resources that sustain all of us. The SAS community recognizes that this land acknowledgement is one small step towards true alliance ship in our effort to uplift the voices, experiences, history, and, and histories of indigenous people of this land and beyond. Um, so I have the honor and privilege of introducing our Bevan speaker rounding out uh, this series, the 2023 series, Angela Dillon. Uh, Angela grew up enjoying the local rivers around the Puyallup watershed, and this passion led her to completing a SAS undergraduate degree and thesis capstone project on prey preferences of three predatory marine fishes, uh, Pacific halibut, Pacific Cod and Flathead Soul. Uh, one of Angela's undergraduate mentors, Ray Buckley, said in his all his years of capstone project mentorship, Angela was by far the best and brightest student he had the pleasure of working with. Angela went on to complete her master's at Evergreen State College, where her thesis focused on juvenile salmon diets, restoration, and vertebrate prey resources in Clear Creek, Washington. Following the completion of her thesis, Angela spent a few years doing water quality assessments for the Snohomish Water Resource inventory area, Lyra 7, and she then came to work for the Tuolup Tribes Fisheries Department as a stock assessment field biologist. Angela is currently the Tuolup Tribes SEPA uh, State Environment Environmental Policy Act reviewer, where she works to process countless permits, app permit applications that span from local to national level project proposals. As the only Tuolup Tribe member with a college degree in the Puyallup Tribes Fisheries Department, Angela is a trailblazer and often asked to speak to youth about salmon and engage and encourage students to study fisheries, especially, especially at SAFs. Uh, please join me in giving a warm welcome to Angela Dillon. Thank you, Thank you Kelly. All right. How is this working? If you can't hear me, let me know. I'm going to go ahead and get started here. All right, Hoxla Hale, Angela Seatstadt. Hello, my name is Angela. My parents are Catherine and Robert Dillon. My mom is Northern Cheyenne, and my dad is Puyallup, Spialapubs, Upshed. I'm a Puyallup tribal member. I was born and raised in Puyallup. I went to Puyallup High School, and I came here to SATS. During my time here, I worked with Dr. Ray Buckley and Troy Buckley. Uh, who ran the food lab over at NOAA on Sandpoint. And we studied uh, food habits of Pacific Cod, Pacific Halibut, and Flathead Sole. And I would like to take a moment to thank Ray and Troy both for all of their help during that project and in the time between. It's actually Ray's nomination that brings me in front of you today and his recommendation that got me into grad school where I got to study juvenile salmon diets on a really important tributary in the Puyallup River. So I opened up a lot more fish stomachs during my graduate studies. And both of those projects were really awesome. I learned so much. I got to do really cool research. Um, but one of the most valuable experiences from some of those projects were the relationships that I built. So during your time here at SAFS, I encourage you to seek out and build those relationships. So currently, I work for the Puyallup Tribe Fisheries Department, and we work in uh, water resource inventory area 10. That's the Puyallup River watershed. And it runs into Commencement Bay, through Tacoma, through the city of Puyallup, boarding, and it comes off of Mount Rainier. The other major river in our watershed is the White, and that runs through Sumner, Auburn, uh, Enumclaw. And we do a lot of work uh, in the watershed. We do a lot of different projects, and it is so much fun. 
We have our juvenile monitoring program. We've got these big barges that sit out in the middle of the river to monitor juvenile salmon. And that provides really important data for our policy and harvest managers to negotiate fishing time for our tribal fishers. Um, I've spent a lot of time on Clear Creek. This is the last tributary that drains into the Puyallup River at River Mile 2.9. And it's the last chance our juvenile salmon have to encounter some of that off-channel habitat so they can get away from those high, fast flows in the Puyallup River and come in, have a little snack, get a little rest. We also do a lot of seining out on the Puyallup River and in the near shore. And we do that to recapture some of the fish that we've tagged in the upper watershed to get an idea of what's out there and um, how early Chinook are starting to leave in January and also because it's really fun. Um, our adult salmon monitoring team is pretty amazing. They walk a lot of the streams in our watershed. Um, we co-manage those streams with WDFW, so we kind of split them half and half, but there are so many streams that we need to monitor. And they count all of the live fish, dead fish, and reds out on those streams for Chinook, for Steelhead, for Coho, for Chum, so it's a lot of work. And they do a pretty amazing job. We also partner with a lot of different organizations in our watershed. Uh, we worked with U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, who has been doing a lot of work in the last few years to pit tag juvenile salmon throughout the watershed. We've got some readers in the lower Puyallup, so we get to see how long it takes to get them there and um, who's coming through. And uh, we also, when we seine for those fish again and we recapture some of those fish with pit tags, we also get to measure them and see how much growth has occurred in that time. So lots of cool projects, um, lots of cool work. Unfortunately, I don't get to do a lot of field work anymore. Um, the past few years, I've been working as the SEPA reviewer for the Puyallup Tribe Fisheries Department. That's State Environmental Policy Act, SEPA. That's environmental law that was at, enacted in 1971, and it's to um, identify and assess environmental impacts that are associated with development. So anytime someone wants to uh, remodel their home or build a grocery store or build a new school or put in a highway, you have to get a permit through that for that. And that permit lists all of the potential impacts to air, to water, to fish, to habitat, to trees, and you uh, you take your permit to the permitting agency, and that could be the city, it could be the county, it could be the Army Corps of Engineers, um, and they are required to consult with the Puyallup tribe. So if there's any work that's being done within our traditional areas, um, I get to see those permits that come through. So in this map that I have up here before you, we've got the outline of Pierce County to the south and King County to the north, and then the purple outlines are just those city boundaries in between them. Um, this, I get permits from a lot of these agencies that you see here, the dots that are here, the yellow, the orange, the pink, the green, those are all permits that Pierce County has passed through since the beginning of the year, since January 1st, um, and that's just Pierce County, that doesn't include the 638 permits that the city of Tacoma passed through in the last 30 days or any of the other agencies that we work with. And we work with many of them um, as co-managers and as a sovereign nation. Um, we consult with a lot of these government agencies and we work to identify impacts to the environment and natural resources, um, avoid those impacts. And if they're unavoidable, then I try to mitigate them or make sure that mitigation occurs. Um, so in my current position, I get to see all of the land use changes that are happening. And there's a lot, as you can see here. Um, there, I get to see every wetland that's being filled. I see every tree that's cut down. I get to see all the housing developments that go in. And all of these uh, develop all of this development, it puts pressure on our natural resources. And our natural resources are not that great to begin with. Um, so when I talk about permit review, um, I look to some of those uh, jurisdictional boundaries, like the county boundaries or the city boundaries. But when we're talking about fisheries management um, for our watershed, I often look to the watershed boundary. So outlined here in blue is Raya 10 or the Puyallup White watershed. There's 72 of these in Washington state and they are defined by the major river system that runs through it and then all the other tributaries that drain into it. So this is Raya 10, the Puyallup White watershed. This is what we're talking about. 
a lot of development happening, a lot of people moving here, a lot of housing needs, um, a lot of housing developments being built, a lot of trees being cut down for that. And the general mindset of our current conditions are not to make things any worse than they are now, no net loss. Um, but unfortunately, we don't come from a place where we have pristine habitat to begin with. Um, I'm gonna zoom in to this red boundary here. And this is uh, the 1873 survey boundary that was designated when the Puyallup tribe signed the Medicine Creek Treaty. So in 1854, we signed the treaty, we lived here within these boundaries. And even though we were confined to living within this boundary here, we were we retained the right in that treaty to fish and hunt in all of our traditional areas. So um, this boundary serves as the reservation boundary or what we call the 1873 survey boundary. And we lived there for some time, um, but as more and more settlers came to our area, they realized how valuable this land was. We have tide flats in the estuary, we have the Puyallup River, we have beautiful trees and plants throughout the area. And so when more and more settlers came to our area, they decided to chop up the reservation into the parcels that you see here, or the allotments. Some of those allotments were given to Puyallup tribal members, uh, usually men, um, not women, even though we're a matriarchal society. Um, and then the rest of them were distributed to the settlers. And now that they have these allotments or parcels, what they could do is start farming that area. Um, so a lot of farms started, started popping up at this time. Um, the Puyallup Valley was actually the largest producer of hops in the nation at one point in time. And there were a lot of homes being built at the same time. But one of the problems is that the Puyallup River uh, is a little unpredictable in the lower watershed. It started to flood out some of the people. It started to compromise some of those farms and those crops and that livestock. So in 1919, uh, the Army Corps of Engineers decided to uh, contain, to channelize the Puyallup River. So the blue line that you see here is the historic flow of the Puyallup River and it bends and it turns. And all of that is really great for juvenile salmon. It's really great salmon habitats. When the river bends like that, it slows down a little bit. Uh, it creates a place for salmon to rest. The water connects with the trees and the plants that are off to the side. It produces, uh, it um, recruits leaf litter, which is great for invertebrate prey resources. So salmon have uh, habitat from fallen trees, they have shade from those trees nearby, they've got great food, all of this is really great. But once you channelize the river, as we see in the red here, um, we lose all of those features. The river essentially becomes a high, fast flow, this slide um, for juvenile salmon. So juvenile salmon get pushed down the river into Commencement Bay, ready or not. And this practice, uh, was pretty common throughout the watershed. Um, agriculture uh, settlements and, and residences were popped up all over the place. Um, so this practice, you see it, the channelization of rivers. You saw it a lot historically, and frankly, we still see some of it today, unfortunately. So the current conditions are development, which is putting pressure on our resources our historic conditions, which created a situation that's not that great to begin with. And then on top of all of that, we've got these climate change pressures as well. Uh, in the Puyallup River watershed, we are a uh, glacial fed river. So the Puyallup River comes off of Mount Rainier and glaciers start to melt in July and August, and they provide cold water inputs from those glaciers and they provide more water quantity as well. And as we lose those glaciers, as they start to retreat, that means less water in the rivers. Less water means that it's going to heat up faster. Our salmon become more susceptible to diseases. Uh, pollution becomes concentrated. Um, there's lots of different things that are gonna happen and uh, threaten and challenge our resources and our salmon in this area. 
Um, so here again is another map of our watershed. Uh, the Puyallup tribe has a water quality team that monitors these conditions throughout the watershed. They monitor them at all of these different sites that you see here. Um, every place in the uh, with the white dots with the red flags on them. And we've been collecting data on temperature, on dissolved oxygen, on pH, on conductivity throughout our watershed at these sites and at chambers in Raya 12, which is the next watershed over that you can see outlined here. Um, in addition to the Puyallup tribe collecting all of this water quality data, there's other agencies in our area in our watershed that also collect this data. And the Department of Ecology uses all of this water quality data to determine uh, which streams are impaired and in what way. So they can determine whether dissolved oxygen is too low in a stream, whether temperatures are too high. They can tell you if pH or conductivity is outside of normal levels, and they flag those um, with a total maximum daily load or 303D listing. So we've got a lot of streams in our watershed that are listed or impaired for temperature. All right, give this a minute to load. So um, in order to confirm uh, or to, to research a little bit further um, how temperature what temperature is doing to our streams. Our assistant director at the Puyallup Tribe Fisheries slash water quality manager, um, she decided she teamed up with some of the other partners in our agency to do a thermal IR study, a uh, thermal infrared study. And it's kind of like what LIDAR, how LIDAR works. Uh, they took a helicopter and they flew it throughout the watershed and attached to that helicopter is a laser which shoots down onto streams and it gives you stream surface temperatures. And we did that for all of the streams that you see here. And what you're looking at is uh, temperatures um, based on that one day, that one hot day in July in 2019 when we went to collect this data. So those dark purple colors, those pink colors that you see, which are close to Mount Rainier, those are the colder or cooler temperatures compared to some of the orange or yellow colors that you see down here in the lower watershed. So we use this data to verify, confirm, investigate uh, which streams we needed to focus our effort on. And it was determined that South Prairie Creek is a good place to start. So Southbury Creek is the top line that you see here. Wilkinson Creek drains into Southbury Creek and that's that center line right here. And Southbury Creek drains into the Carbon River, which is the purple line down at the bottom. Carbon River drains into the Puyallup. Now, if you remember what I just said, the purple and pink colors are those cooler temperatures while the orange and the yellow are a little bit warmer. So the first thing that we can see when we look at this is that both South Prairie and Wilkeson Creek have much higher temperatures compared to the Carbon River where they're drained at. So we definitely need to figure out what's going on and why. And the other really cool piece um, of data that was collected with this thermal IR study uh, were what we call significant features. So this te technology is so sensitive and really, really cool. It's able to detect where cold water inputs are coming in. So all of these pink triangles that you see are potentially cold water inputs coming in. So, the other reason that we decided to look at South Prairie and Wilkeson Creek is because they are important salmon bearing streams. So just to orient you again, we've got our watershed boundary outline here in pink, and then our study area is about mid watershed. That's where South Prairie Creek and Wilkeson are. And uh, South Prairie Creek is the most productive stream in our watershed for all species of salmon. 
Um, like I said, we co-manage some of these streams with uh, the, Depart the Washington State Department of Fish and Wildlife. So WDFW biologists walk Southbury Creek and our tribal biologists uh, walk up Wilkeson Creek and they count all of the live fish, dead fish and reds um, for Chinook, for coho, for chum and for steelhead on South Curry and Wilkeson Creeks. And this is just a chart from the most recent year of data that we have showing you uh, numbers or counts of live Chinook and dead Chinook that were recorded. And the maximum number here in 2021 was 400. Um, and some years is higher and some years is lower, um, but overall we're at about 3% of what our historic runs used to be here in the Puyallup River watershed, which is uh, makes me a little sad to say that. Um, one of the other things to note is that South Prairie Creek also had the highest number of steelhead reds um, than any other stream in our watershed. So it's a very productive stream. So it's a good place to start our research. So what we wanted to do, our goal for this study is to improve thermal diversity on South Prairie and Wilkeson Creeks. So we wanted to collect habitat data and data on uh, salmon use throughout these two streams. So our friends at US Fish and Wildlife Services put us in touch with some individuals here at the University of Washington. And they helped us to look at their riverscape methods. And if you get a chance, um, look up riverscape methods because it's this really great way to take habitats and salmon data throughout the entire length of a stream. And it gives you some really, really great information on what you're looking at. And I think for this study, it would have been really helpful, but unfortunately, uh, we didn't have the time, uh, the staff, or the funding to do an entire riverscape survey. So we had to take the 22 miles of anadromous um, streams that we have, 15 miles on South Prairie and seven miles on Wilkeson, and whittle it down into something that our staff and with help from one or two others could do in two or three weeks last summer. So uh, we used the thermal IR data from 2019 to kind of identify where some really cool significant features might be. Um, we used it to figure out if there was any um, weird thermal anomalies happen that we wanted to look at. But I think for the most part, um, we used our tribal biologists and their input to decide how to choose <laughs> these reaches um, to study, to do habitat assessments and snorkeling surveys on. Our biologists at the tribe have been there for 10, 20, 30 years, and they've got so much knowledge and so much experience on the ground. Um, they've had a lot of input and a lot of feedback that helped us to determine um, to select these reaches to study. So for our survey, what we did uh, was we would go out to one of these reaches, and the first thing that we would do is identify what type of habitat unit we were in. So are we in a pool, are we in a riffle, or are we in a glide? And once we determined the habitat unit and the length of that unit, um, we would take a temperature at the beginning, uh, the middle, and the end point of each of those habitat units within all of the different reaches that we have that I just showed you. In addition to temperature, uh, we also collected other habitat features. We counted wood, we counted log jams, uh, we looked at substrate, we looked at percent cover. Um, we wanted to do a rapid habitat assessment. Um, so we took those riverscape methods and we tried to pull out what we thought might be important for our habitat assessment into something that we could do um, with the staff and time that we had. We also noted other important features that we thought might be worthy, uh, not notable, like gravel bars, beaver dams, culverts, that sort of thing. Uh, we took the wetted width and the bankful width of all of the habitat units that we identified. And then we ground truthed all of those significant features from the 2019 thermal IR study. So if we had a reach that had one or two or three significant features within it, we would go find it. Um, it would show up as a point on our field maps app because we collected all of our uh, data digitally. And we would identify what it was. Is this an incoming tributary? Is it a seep? Is it hyperreic flow? 
um, what exactly is that feature? And then we would take a temperature of it too, so that we can compare it to not only the 2019 data uh, that we had from our thermal IR, but also the 2022 data that we were collecting right then at that time. And then once we were done collecting all of our uh, habitat data, we had our staff snorkel those reaches to look for um, salmon to see what's out there for abundance and distribution. All right, and this is the results. So these are our different reaches outlined here. And I probably won't have time to go through every single one of, with you, but we are gonna go through a few of them and kind of pull out some interesting things that I, I kind of thought um, might help us uh, as we go through a second round of data collection this summer and as we develop um, a solution to help us improve thermal diversity in these streams. So this is our first reach that we surveyed. Uh, this is South Prairie Creek, River Mile 0 0.3. And remember that I said we identified each of those habitat units. So for every pool, every riffle, every glide, we've got temperature at the beginning, middle, and end of each of those units. And so we took those three points, those three temperature points, we averaged them, transformed them into a line, and then color coded them into different temperatures. So the line that you're seeing here in this reach is the longitudinal temperature profile for uh, this section of the stream. Uh, red and orange are warmer temperatures, and then the yellow, green, and blue are gonna be the cooler temperatures. So I think the first thing that is noteworthy uh, in this reach is that we've got some really warm temperatures on the upstream part of this reach, and they get much cooler um, on the downstream part of this reach. If I click on one of these lines, I can show you uh, what the habitat unit was, what the average temperature was based on those three points that we took. So here it's 20.53 degrees which as you know, uh, is pretty warm. Um, I'm pretty sure that the recommendations for uh, salmon rearing, migration and spawning is 17.5 degrees for no more than seven days in a row. Um, so 20.53 is definitely concerning. Uh, so we've got high temperatures in the red and orange here in the upstream part of the reach and lower temperatures here in the downstream part of the reach. And why is that? Well, the first thing I noticed is that right in the middle of those two points where those temperatures kind of diverge from warm to cooler is that we have a significant feature. So here in this black dot with the little star in the middle of it is one of our cold water inputs. So these are the places that our 2019 thermal IR study identified as a cold water feature. So when we were out there, we were like, okay, I've got this point, let's go figure out what it is. It's an incoming stream. And when we took the temperature, it was 12.5 degrees. And 12.5 degrees compared to 20.5 degrees or you know, even 17 or 16 degrees, that is, that's pretty amazing to see that. Um, you know, this is a great, cold water refugia spot if we can maintain it. Um, so one possible hypothesis is that this incoming stream is contributing cold water, which makes these downstream areas a little bit cooler. Um, the other thing to note in this reach um, are these little purple spots uh, with a little pink in them sometimes here. And that's our fish distribution. Those are hot spots for fish. So if I click on one of these spots, we can see uh, exactly what was observed during our snorkel surveys. And in here, it looks like we, we've seen 110 trout. Um, and that is, I think the highest number of fish, there were 90 down just downstream of that, but 110 fish, 90, 90 trout down here. And you'll notice that they're sticking to those cool areas, first of all, and they're pretty close to that incoming stream. And it could be the flow that's attracting them, or it could be the temperature that's attracting them, but I thought that was kind of interesting. Um, the next 
reach that I want to show you. Wrong way. There we go. Uh, this is South Prairie Creek at River Mile 3.7. And the cool thing about this reach is that it's a restoration site. So it took our partners, um, Trail of Tribes, South Puget Sound, Salmon Enhancement Group, Pierce County, a bunch of people, about 20 years to get this restoration project going. It was just a series of grants that we had to use to start with design, go to construction, go get through permitting, and it did take a really long time to get through this. So while it, it is a really, really great project, it's an amazing project, it looks beautiful out there. And as you can see, there's a lot of hot spots with salmon in it. Um, what we're hoping to do with this study is find a solution that's a little more short-term. Um, we don't want our salmon to have to wait another 20 years to go through big restoration projects like this. First of all, because I don't think they have the time. Uh, the situation is so dire. We've got all of these different pressures that I was telling you about um, compounding each other. And I think that we need to take fast action. And so that's kind of the point of the study is to figure out what we can do uh, and what we can do quickly. Um, so here at this site, uh, what I think is really cool is that, first of all, you don't see any of those red lines. So those red lines, those really hot temperatures that we just saw in the last reach, they don't exist here in this restoration site, which I think is kind of interesting that as a comparison, um, restored site might not have high as high temperatures. And then the second is that this reach has the highest abundance of salmon that we saw compared to any of the other reaches that we surveyed. So if you build it, they will come. It's just salmon find the good spots. They really do. They, they know what they're doing. Um, so if I click on one of these salmon hotspots here, we can see that there were 415 coho that were observed and then a few trout as well. And what's really cool about uh, the field maps application is that all of the pictures that you take while you're out there are so easily accessible. So here's a cool picture of the preserve. And I just need to figure out how to get out of it one second. <laughs> All right, there we go. And then back at full screen. Okay. So I think the other important thing to note is that when you have a temperature impaired stream, the guidance from the Department of Ecology is to plant trees. And that is a good solution. Trees provide shade, um, but there's a couple of different problems with that. The first is that it's a long-term solution. It takes a long time for trees to grow and to provide those functions of shade to our salmon. And the second is that um, both South Prairie and Wilkeson Creek have a lot of private property ownership along them. So we've had a lot of challenges dealing with private property owners who don't want us to plant trees on their property. Either they don't wanna give up the space, they don't wanna provide uh, conservation easement. They don't want us physically on the property. They don't want to block their view for whatever reason. Um, we've struggled a lot with getting private property owners to help us um, with this tree planting solution. So another reason to come up with an alternative or a creative solution to providing thermal diversity in these streams. So all of this data, let me just go I would like to share one more reach with you before we move on. Here we go. So this reach right here is uh, Wilkeson Creek at River Mile 0 0.1. And I think what's important about this story or this uh, reach is that on the uh, nobody eats east side of the stream, there is um, there was a bunch of fill that was put in to support uh, railroad and trail system. 
And um, as we were walking on that trail to access our reaches on Wilkeson Creek, we noticed a wetland complex and standing water on the other side, on the landward side of that, um, of that fill, of that trail system. And so we started taking temperatures of it. And we found that even during the hottest parts of the day, that water was cooler compared to the temperatures that we were taking in the stream. So one of the things, one of the solutions that we're hoping to propose is to see if we can find a way to punch holes in that railroad uh, prism in order to connect that flow, that cold flow uh, into the stream and provide some re thermal relief. Okay, so we've done all this field work. We've we've got all this data. We we see where the fish are going. Um, I think the other thing that is noteworthy from the data that we collected was that when we started to collect this data, we also looked at all of the pools that we had identified, and we wanted to take a vertical temperature profile of all of the pools. We wanted to see if there was any thermal stratification, any difference in temperature between the surface and between the bottom. And about halfway through our study, with all of the time that we spent trying to take those vertical temperatures in each of our pools, we found that there really wasn't a difference. Um, so we had to abandon that. Um, because it's taking too much time, because it wasn't really worth our effort, because it wasn't really that much of a difference. These pools didn't seem to be providing any uh, thermal um, refuge. So we need a different idea. <laughs> um, so the, the, we can't engineer pools that are big enough or deep enough to provide that thermal stratification within this system, because we need something that's probably eight feet wide or eight feet deep, and it will likely get blown out with the first big flow anyways. So we need other ideas. And one of the proposals, one of the thoughts, one of the things that we could try, um, especially if we get more data to support this, is to do something like this. This cold alcove that you see over here, um, the idea is that now we have, now that we have ground truth to all of these uh, cold water inputs, we've confirmed that they do in fact add in, um, that they are colder than the mainstream temperature and that they do add a little um, diversity, thermal diversity to our streams. What we need to do is to prevent them from mixing in with the warm water of the mainstream uh, of the mainstream and then flowing downstream where they don't provide any relief to salmon. We need to be able to find a way to keep those cold spots where they are. So that the idea proposed is to create some of these cold alcoves to uh, provide a little off channel area to uh, put in some wood um, to um, find a way to keep that cold water uh, where it's at so that it actually can provide a cold water refugia instead of just mixing with warm water and washing downstream. And I think one of the other uh, important things to note is that in the restoration site, that 20 year restoration site that we were working on in Southbury Creek, um, one of the one of the uh, things, one of the one of the um, engineering ideas was to um, grade the stream. So when you have an undercut bank, you lose the connection between the stream bank and the floodplain next to it. But when you grade the stream, like we did um, in our restoration site here on South Curry Creek, you reconnect that stream bed to the floodplain. So now you can have groundwater flow between those two systems. And groundwater, as you know, is cooler in the summer um, and warmer in the winter, which our fish really like. And it could also be the reason why we have that upwelling in that restoration site. Um, so that could also be another possible solution that we could be looking at. Um, I think the other thing that I wanted to take away from this is that uh, temperature is one of the most important abiotic factors for our salmon. Uh, you know, we, 
We've been really keen in our restoration sites on adding in wood, on replanting trees, um, on installing gravel, on doing some of these habitat features. And we've been a lot slower to incorporate this idea of improving thermal diversity into restoration or habitat projects. And I think that going forward, we need to keep that in mind um, and continue to do projects like this that kind of challenge us to think um, of different ways to identify and protect those cold water refugia. Um, the other thing is that that big restoration site took 20 years to do, and it involved a lot of different people, uh, a lot of money. And the other thing is the 2019 thermal IR study that we did involved a lot of people. It involved a lot of money. And no one, not one of us, could have done that work by ourselves. You know, we all had to contribute our own time, our own energy, our own efforts um, to making these things happen. So again, those relationships that you build within your watershed with the work that you do, they are so, so very important to doing this kind of work that we have here. And um, before I end, let me just find this. There we go. Um, before I end, I just wanted to let you know there were so many people involved in this study. There was um, our entire group at Puyallup Tribe Fisheries, the GIS team who helped to create the story map that you're seeing today and all of the results. And they went through all of our data that we collected, which was um, a challenge in itself. Um, <laughs> we had help from the South Puget Sound Salmon Enhancement Group, and they were actually the project managers for that big restoration site that we saw. Um, we had staff from WDFW helping us out in the field, U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service providing some expertise along with, you know, the people here at the UW, and it's just amazing uh, the work that we can do um, when we all have, when we share those goals and we, when we share that work. So I just wanted to say thank you to everyone who was involved. And of course, thank you to the staff here for having me, uh, for setting all of this up, being on the back end of this. I can see how much work it was. So I really appreciate all of your effort. Thank you. Okay, questions. I see one in the middle. So your theory on like salmon or at certain parts of the South Prairie Creek, because a while ago, back in the day when the non salmon didn't appear in the Green River or any other river, I only saw like one pink salmon in one site of the South Prairie, the same river you're focusing on. Just one little pink salmon. That was it. Not a single other one. So there were probably fewer likely because the temperatures were in just different areas. They're at a place where there was restoration. And also they probably already just swim up to the place where they had to be. Yeah. So the, the question is, um, you know, there is this variability in places where we find these salmon and observe um, them uh, out in the field. And it's quite possible that we are, um, we're hypothesizing that yes, uh, Restoration sites definitely provide habitat um, that, you know, even as we're snorkeling, you can feel temperature differences. So if you go by one of these significant features, you know, in a dry suit, you can feel that temperature difference. So, you know, salmon, of course, are going to be able to do the same thing and hone in on that thermal diversity. And, you know, that's something that biologists and fishers, uh, you know, intuitively know and, and see, but now we've got, um, especially if we continue to do this research, more and more data to support that in the real world, for sure. Uh, Kitty up front. Um, for uh, the areas where it seems like thermal, like dampening of thermal stress parts of the river um, and watershed areas, uh, was there more, or have they done any work in interesting so the question is, um, you know, we're, we're looking at thermal diversity. Has there been any work to investigate um, prey availability for our juvenile salmon as well? Because we all know that, you know, with increased temperatures, basal metabolic rates of salmon rise. Um, so, so just existing out in the river um, takes a lot more energy. And if you include, you know, things like hunting and hunting for food into that, you've got a lot more expenditure of energy. So 
um, I, you know, essentially those prey demands are going to be a little bit higher. Um, and the answer is yes. Um, it's not on this stream, but we have done quite a few years of invertebrate prey resource uh, research on uh, Clear Creek, which is a lower watershed stream. And what we found from those studies was um, not surprising, uh, a connection, a correlation, um, a trend, uh, that is the right word, a trend that shows areas that have been restored have higher terrestrial abundance and diversity compared to areas that are not restored. So definitely more bugs available and better bugs available. And the other thing that we confirmed with that study, which I thought was really cool, is that um, your mayflies and your caddisflies, which are associated with good water quality, are uh, superfoods for salmon. So our salmon superfood has a superfood of its own, those caddisflies and those mayflies. So finding a way to promote those um, prey items is also another strategy. Uh -huh. Here. Yeah. Um... So you probably hear a lot of sort of restoration of things you can do to make cooler spots of the stream. Are there um, sort of continuing threats uh, for existing cover so that there would be pressure for the stream to be warmer? And what can you tell us about the state and the tribal um, processes to make sure that doesn't happen? Um, so the question is the continuing threats of cover and the lack of it on the stream and what we're doing to address that. Okay. Um, thank you. Uh, so there is a lot of work. Um, that restoration site that I showed you here in South Prairie Creek is phase one. Um, currently there is a phase two in process and it's been going on for years and years as well. And uh, the first part of that process is to acquire properties. So we're looking at places that people who wanna sell, at people who you know have inherited land that no longer want to run a farm, that um, are willing to give up a conservation easement, at um, uh, any other public lands where we can do restoration at, and we've identified a semi-contiguous tract of land for phase two. There's just one parcel missing in there that we're really close to getting, um, so that we can start another big restoration project like this. So we're definitely working on more and more stuff, but it's it's hard. It's it's definitely a challenge. Uh, here in the middle. Uh, I was just wondering uh, how your decision-making process is informed by your background, both as a scientist as well as being a member of the division. Um, so the question is how decision-making processes are informed uh, for us both a scientist and a member of the Puyallup tribe. Um, so one of the things that I have been focusing on recently uh, is enhancing my knowledge of uh, traditional ecological knowledge and tribal environmental knowledge. And part of that was driven because of I was asked to you know, help form a class that actually incorporates both of those two things together. And the other is that, you know, I do want to know all of those things myself. And it's a lifelong process to do that. Um, being out there with the people who know where to go, where to harvest, what time, when one thing blooms, this event happens, how um, climate change is mismatching the timing of certain things, and that's observed by our harvests, our gatherers out there. And I think that looking at the work that we do sort of through the lens of there is more to offer, that, you know, just keep an open mind that there's not one way to do anything right and that we should always continually ask ourselves, what else can I do? What else can I learn from? Who else can I ask? Yes, sat in the back with a hat. Okay, one more time. Sorry. How long would you in fish restoration? And if there would be any restoration, 
Okay, so the question is, um, with the short term solutions that we're proposing that we're thinking about, um, how long do we think that those are going to last? Let's, let's start with that one. Um, and the answer is, you know, hopefully with something like, if we can include some of these, like engineered log jams into an Alco feature to sort of stabilize that feature, um, if we can put it as sort of an off channel feature where it's not in direct flow with you know, those heavy rains that we're now getting in a, as we change from a snow dominant to a rain dominant system um, and the flooding that occurs, that hopefully um, we can make them semi-permanent at least to the point where uh, these restoration projects start to go in the ground, where we start to acquire more property, where we start to do um, or implement some of those more long-term solutions, I guess. So I, I wouldn't say I have, and five years, 10 years, but you know, the hope is that to allow one to overlap and just to put in multiple contingencies. And I'm sorry, I think there was another part, but I'm gonna I'm gonna jump over here. Yes. <laughs> I know. Great talk. Thank you. Thank you. Um, given how long and challenging it is to acquire land for these restoration projects, you know, to not the South Prairie Tribune and the other ones with us. I'm wondering what the restoration potential looks like for the rest of the water. So the question is, uh, given the challenges that we face with um, acquiring land and how long that takes and how expensive that is, uh, what's the outlook for the rest of the watershed? Um, and that's, you know, we bite off uh, what we can do. Um, so if I think identifying first and prioritizing these streams that either have good salmon habitat or used to have good salmon habitat or have high productivity and starting at that place might be a good way to look at it because I don't think we can do everything. I don't think that we're gonna have, you know, a good chance to restore every single stream that we need to, um, but I think we don't need to. I think the other thing that we can do in addition to, you know, these on the ground, projects and this data collection is also to educate people and, and let them know, you know, hey, trees are good, let's plant them, um, let's not pollute, you know, let's, let's minimize our development and our footprints and, you know, reduce our waste and all of those other things too. So there's lots of different strategies, I guess. <laughs> Another question, yes. Um, so the question is, you know, a lot of this river has been channelized. Is there any way to get it back to what it used to be and allow some flow and reconnection um, without having to purchase a whole bunch of, of land? And, um, you know, our, our project down in Clear Creek, we've got three or four different restoration projects, and not we, I say um, the partners in our watershed, the Port of Tacoma, Pierce County, the Puyallup Tribe, we all have restoration projects on Clear Creek. And some of that involved acquisition. Um, some of that was land that was already, that we already had. And some of that was improvements um, to the site that already existed. So at the lower Clear Creek site, which is just at the confluence of the Puyallup River and Clear Creek, which is that last tributary before, um, we get to Commencement Bay. That site was recently transformed. So last summer, Pierce County um, did a project to create these, they called them bellies. So they, they connected the wetland, which was adjacent to the mainstream Clear Creek, and they did that sort of punching of holes through uh, the, the structure, the road that existed to connect the wetland and the mainstream there and allow the water flow to come in, allow the, you know, habitat to improve. And um, I am hoping this month or next month or really, really soon to get out there and same within those bellies and see what kind of fish are out there too. So, you know, um, there are some solutions uh, to do that. So punching, you don't need to like make it like a whole fish patch and thing. 
Um, well, the, the stream that I'm talking about is tidally influenced. So they created, uh, they carved out um, sections of the road to allow flow to come in at different tidal cycles. And so it'll, uh, the water will come in and then it'll drain back out when the tide leaves. And that um, disturbance regime, you know, that's really good for, it's great for uh, invertebrate production. Um, it, you can see how the exchange is happening. The, the Puyallup, you can see the Puyallup River, which is very, a very distinct color, um, enter into Clear Creek and then come back out again. And um, it was maybe six feet wide by six feet tall for, you know, one of, one of the different bellies that they punched out. And it seems to be working really well. And we need a little bit of data to support fish use back there, but I think that we can definitely look for that this year. And we'll cut it off there. There's a recent recommended slide if you want to add the potential there.